reading from 1 Kings 13. Now, And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jerome was standing by the altar to make offering. And a man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And he shall sacrifice on you the priest of the high place who make offering on you. And human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar, Bethel, Jerome stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him! And his hand, which he had stretched out against him, dried up, so he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was torn down, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, Oh, come home with me, and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. And the man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go in with you, and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so was it commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water, nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit has to say. You may be seated. The nameless man confronts the mighty king. As we saw last week, Jeroboam had now consolidated his reign in Israel by building his capital city, by um, build, fortifying the city across the Jordan against Judah. He was strong, but yet he still feared that the people would go back, so he invented his own religion. He put a calf in there, he put a calf here at Bethel, and he told them, here is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Don't know if it's so much open idolatry as so much as he broke the command that God had told them not to make an image of him. And it certainly went against the command that in Jerusalem is where his name would be made as we saw with Solomon. And no command had come, but yet Jeroboam was driven by fear. Irrational fear because God had promised him that his house and his kingdom would be sure if he followed him like David. And yet instead of following God, who had kept his promise and given him Jeroboam the kingdom, he now breaks free and does what is right in his own eyes to maintain his power. And so here Jeroboam is, as we saw at the end of 12, offering sacrifice on this altar and a man from Judah. How interesting. So here we have the mighty king, the king of a nation. And here we have a man who is literally the man without a name. In fact, his name is the man of God. And how wonderful and what a joyful privilege it would be to not be known by one's name or one's last name or one's profession but simply to be known as a man or a woman of God. That when people think of you, they don't actually think about you. Isn't that the one thing we want people, right? When people, you know, maybe you're not like me, so you're not as twisted as upon yourself. But, right, we like to think, when somebody thinks about me, what do, I, what do I want people to think about me, right? We think, you know, what do I want people to say at my funeral when I'm gone, right? What do I, how do I want to be remembered? There's a problem in that statement in and of itself, isn't it? Do we want people to think about us a certain way? And we're not really concerned about, am I pointing to God? We're not about what people think about me. Here's Jeroboam, king of the nation, chosen to be king of the nation. 
And yet, here's a man whose name is not recorded in Scripture. He simply says, a man of God came out. He came out of Judah to confront Jeroboam and his sin. And so, as we look into this text today, there's four, four things we see, particularly connected to God's Word, as we think about this man of God. Because it's very important. Most of us, our names aren't going to be known throughout history, nor should that be our goal. But our goal should be to be men and women of God, so the world knows us or not. And that is so important, because isn't that sadly always the goal, it seems to be the goal anymore in ministry and Christianity, to be the big thriving church, to have your name out there so everybody recognizes, instead of just serving God, and when people think as much about you as one might, because we're pretty self-centered people, so we don't think that much about each other. But, right, that they would think about God. And so what we're going to look at today is, for being men and women of God, then it starts with you go by the word of the Lord. Right? That's first off, right? If you're going to be a man of God, if you're going to be a woman of God, you can't go and say God's word to anybody, let alone a mighty king, if it's not actually God's word. Right? As it says in verse 1, And behold, the man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord. Why did he go? Because God told him to. God spoke to him and said, Go. And so we cannot go and say anything that we have not been prompted to by God and by His Word. Now, we see this, and this is what, why is this man so important? It's not him. And that's true for us. If we're going to be men, if we're going to bear witness to God, it's not about us, it's about the message that we are given. Right? Today's St. Patrick's Day, right? It's kind of ironic the way we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Right? If you think about it. St. Patrick, right? Why did he go to Ireland? Why did he go back? Right? He was taken, he was captured as a slave, which might be why people don't like this story. And right, he's a white guy. He's you know from Britain. Captures a slave, goes to Ireland, mystery, sees the ministry. There he actually learns to walk with God. Because he was like basically a pastor's kid or a deacon's kid. But he didn't care. He in his right. Oh, I don't care about God. I didn't know God. He gets there and he walks, he learns to walk with God as he shepherds sheep by himself. Then he sees a vision. There's your boat. Go home. Gets up, walks out, goes home, feels called into the priest, into the ministry, becomes a pastor. And then there's another dream. In which God says, go back. Go back to the people that raided you. Go back. And so he goes back. And he brings the gospel to Ireland. But see, for St. Patrick, it wasn't about him, was it? It was about him getting back at the Irish. It was about the message of the gospel. He took the message to people who, it would seem, did at that time in Ireland, you know, the Celtic religions, even as far as human sacrifice. And he took the hope of the gospel and transformed that little island. That's why I always say, if you really want to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, you know what I think we would do? We would hold a giant prayer meeting and pray for missionaries. Because that's what St. Patrick was about. He was about the gospel. He was about prayer. Heck, he says, you know, when he was shepherding, he got to where he said, I pray a hundred times a day. St. Patrick doesn't want us to honor him. He wants us to honor his God. That's why he's God. And so it is with this, this man of God. And we see here, I like this quote from one of the theology books I study out of sometimes. It says this, Yahweh tends to speak through the prophets rather than directly to individuals. What is authoritative is not the human messenger, but the divine message. So if you look at, we see this in Deuteronomy, right? Um, and this is something that uh, people that have been familiar with when this prophet shows up. So Deuteronomy 18 and 18 says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. 
brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will inquire it of him. Now this is actually Moses speaking, and Moses is saying that someone, uh, God is speaking through Moses here, but Moses is saying that someone greater, God is going to raise up somebody greater than me who he's going to speak to. That someone he's actually referring to here is Jesus. And what did Jesus always say? This is not what I have, this is what the Father has. Right? This is what the Father says, this is what God says, right? So, and how much more true it be those of us who are if we're going to speak to we need to speak to the Word of God and follow Christ's purpose. Right? What gives the mess? There is no authority within the human message. No human messenger has any right to authority or power or prestige. It is only the message. It is God who is all those things. And it is Him working through the messenger. And see, that is lies the danger. Sometimes I think we think, oh, I am God's self-appointed messenger to fix everything in life. And it becomes about us and not the message. We let it go to our hands. We may start off well and good, but then we hear people praise us and say, oh, this and that. And then, boom, we go astray. Now, what I want to do here is give an example. Give us an example. We're going to follow throughout our rest of the message today. Of all right, so the word of the Lord comes to him and he goes, right? So how do I know when God's word comes to me and I go? Right? Certainly this is a miraculous thing to happen. But I'm going to suggest to you, particularly for the men, but also for the ladies too, this works for you, that God has that God has given you his word and he wants you to go and give a message. And it's very distinct and it's in scripture. Let's, so let's go to Ephesians 6. Strange to me, so 
sensitive because I think it goes against, now again, you say, Pastor, you're saying this is natural for men to want to do that. It's an example of program. I think we think there's two things going on, but I'm going to continue with why I say that. Alright, I like this quote, another quote here from Nancy Pierce, she says, about those who are single. And if you are single, you can experience a meaningful sense of spiritual fatherhood through mentoring relationships such as uncle, pastor, coach, or teacher. This is actually true of my life. I remember when I got done high school, I went right into coaching. Now part of that, a lot of times, I was just like sports. But I found I really liked the kids too. And I wasn't sure at that point of where to get married. I was like, I do like these kids. I could see people from other than I have kids. Right? And then certainly the pastor and other things. So, so understand too, right? And we see this uh, in Scripture. The Apostle Paul, to our knowledge, had no natural children. But certainly he considered himself Timothy and Titus as spiritual fathers did. And developing, developing them and discipling them. But Jesus did not have physical children. But yet, it certainly when you read the scriptures, you see him interact with those around him as a father. Because what he say, I am like a father. You know what the father's like because you see me. Even in our own nation's history, when you look at the life of George Washington, the father of our country, who had no natural children, by the way. He had two adopted children that talked about him as being a great father with influence upon their lives. And then there was Lafayette, the young Frenchman, as well as other numerous um, young American officers in the army that looked at him as a father. And who he certainly interacted with. You know, Washington, unlike so many other supposedly great men, was very loving and affectionate in men around him. And developed him. And so what, one of the things we see about fathers and parenthoods, and the true for you ladies too, is that it's really discipleship. Parenting is disciple. And this is why the scripture tells parents to instruct their kids in this way. It's why kids are told to submit to their parents. Because no learning can happen unless you want to submit to the person who teaches. Right? If the thing that you remember too about discipleship is like like the disciples, from what I understand in that time, or those who could follow a rabbi. If the rabbi would take off his right sandal first, Everybody else would unstrap their right sandal first. Like they were that too. So that also carries a lot of responsibility. So why am I saying men are programmed to be fathers? I'm going to give you two examples. One would be the world. So evolution, right? Evolution would say it's a drive to reproduce, survival to finish, right? I want my genes to survive into the next generation. Well, that's not the same as fatherhood. Having a child is not the same as being a father to the child. Number one. Number two, right, that also goes with, you know, well, you know, this one I don't really want to keep around so we can get rid of this one. Chuck up with that is something that happened a lot in the nation. Ah, uh, that I stuck with the wrong girl, so we're gonna get rid of that. Well, no, that could be true. That you know, when people act that way and think that way, that they're acting within the realm of the survival of the fittest, and they're acting more like animals than they are like human beings. But then we also have, I think, another explanation for why we say this, and that is the Word of God. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis 1. I'm going to get an echo here. I'm going to get an echo here. Did you fall asleep back there? Okay. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and God created him, male and female he created them. Now you say, well, Pastor Ben, that says nothing about men being created as fathers. How did Jesus refer to 
God the Father. I just gave it away. God the Father. The Father sent me. The Father did this. I'm going to be with my Father. God describes himself as a Father. So if God made us in his image, his likeness, God designed us to care and nurture and develop others. Let us go back to First Kings now. And so it is by the word of God. And so, as we come back here to our story. Have the Word of God. We go by the Word of God. And now we say speak by the Word of God. You can only speak what God has told you to say. So notice verse 2. And the man cried against the altar. Interesting, he doesn't cry against Jeroboam. No, I mean, he is crying against Jeroboam. Jeroboam figured that out. But he, he doesn't aim what he's saying directly at Jeroboam. Now, it's hard to say why God decided he wanted him to respond in this way. It is possible that Jeroboam wasn't even making out that he was necessarily the guy behind all this. Remember, because he conferred with the leaders of Israel, and maybe his new priest that he appointed said, hey, this is what God said we're supposed to do. Right? And so what you see here, and we're going to see throughout the text, is God is making very clear, what you're doing, I don't accept. This is not true worship of me. I reject whatever this is, and I reject you. And it is pretty abrupt person that we're going to see. And so he cries against the altar. Right? Again, what God has told him. Altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, the son shall be poured to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned. Wow! This is intense. So those false priests that Jeroboam you appointed, Josiah by name, 500 years later, is going to come along. He's going to dig up their bones, put it on the altar, and burn. That's what he's going to do. That is pretty intense, I would say. That would be like if the South actually won the Civil War, and then as Jefferson Davis in the Confederacy was having a parade, some random guy walks up to Jefferson Davis and says, I name Eisenhower is going to come to the south in the year whatever, and he's going to burn Richmond to the ground. Like, that is the extent of what's happening as they're celebrating. You think that's going to go over well? Probably not. All right, so he cries against the altar. He says, this is going to happen. We're going to see this. That's exactly what happens. And see, Jeroboam knows what that means. Because... If a son of David, who they've all rejected, is strong enough to invade, that means probably Jeroboam's house is the seven turn trouble. Right? In fact, there's such trouble, they're not even the power of this actually takes place. Right? Because God's only here to put the out before them. But Jeroboam understands this, this is God's judgment. This, this is bigger than just Josiah showing up and burning bones. This is like national collapse. And that's how it was understood. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This sign that the Lord has spoken, behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are in it shall be poured out. What's important to understand about that is proper ritual in the, in the Levitic, that is laid out in Leviticus for sacrifice. If the ashes touch up, these were sacrificial ashes, if those ashes touched the ground, they became worthless. Okay? You couldn't let the ashes touch the ground. It was a disgrace. Kind of like you know, the flag. You're not supposed to let the flag touch the ground here, the flag here. That's a disgrace. It's kind of the same idea. So he talks about the ashes pouring on the ground. And so if God's going to rent the altar and the ashes are going to pour to the ground, that is God saying what? I reject this. This is not true worship. This is false worship. So, think about this. Father, what should we speak against? He spoke all this. 
order for. And this is sort of a tack on point in a sense. This is true. Even as fathers, right? The world is always trying to bribe us not to do the thing that God has called us to do. Because, alright, so all this happens, right? And then the king does what? He's like, oh, that was dumb. Oh man of God, please pray for me, because I would really like to use my hand. <laughs> right? And so he does, and his hand is restored, and then he says, hey, you come with me to my house, right? And I'll give you, I'll give you a bunch of money. Now, why would the king do this? It doesn't say specifically there. It would seem, based on how Jeroboam ultimately will see response to this whole event, he, he really wasn't repentant. He wasn't really sorry. He had no real desire to change what he had done. But if he was really, what his real fear was that he would lose the kingdom. If that was his fear. That he just had a man from God confront him reject his religion as false. So, oh boy, this is like King Saul and Samuel. Are people going to follow me? Hey, if you walk with me now, and everybody sees that you're kind of my buddy, and then maybe everybody will think, hey, we're still okay with God. And he's like, no. Because God's not okay with you. You gave me the whole world. I wouldn't go with you. I mean, this is pretty harsh stuff. Like, this really hurts in our postmodern era of being nice. Like, no, you are not worshiping God. God does not approve you. And this is part of the sign I that God is showing to Jeroboam. I am rejecting you, and I am rejecting to the nation, and I reject this form of worship. This is not what I said to do. I reject it. Nothing of it. I'm leaving. We're done. This, this is that city. And why does he do that? Because he says in there, right, God told me to not drink anything, to not eat, to go straight home, not receive anything from anybody. So he's doing this by what? God's word. So it is by God's word that we achieve what? Integrity and virtue. And we obey. And how does the world try to bribe us to act? Just about any way possible. Right? Wants us, hey, you know, Watch football. You can watch football. Athletics. And it's not that you can't ever do anything that involves athletics. But when those things begin to eat up time in which we're not instructing our kids and being there with our family and doing those things, that becomes a problem. That becomes a problem. It's a problem, right? You can have satisfaction, you can have happiness, you can have more money. If you do this, and it just turns into a lot. One distraction after another distraction instead of doing what God told us to do. Right? The prophet has one thing on his mind. Do what God said, boom. And so should that not be our goal? What has God told us to do? Boom. Yeah, I'm not saying you can never as a dad. You know, I, I still...